My name is Steve Feiner. I'm a professor of computer science at Columbia. And in my talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my lab and then try to dive into one specific uh, project that we've worked on. So the talk is on AR for task assistance. And my lab has been doing AR for quite a while. That has included work on navigation, travel, tourism, um, in this case, uh, dating back some two decades uh, with big monster backpacks that got successively smaller over the years. This one is our second or third down to maybe 20 odd pounds as opposed to 40. Um, uh, by the way, all the, all the pictures I'm going to show you are from actual real running applications. These aren't things that are fanciful or stuff uh, pulled off the web. Um, information workspaces is something that's been very interesting to us uh, for around 25 years or so, taking legacy applications running in, in this case, X11 uh, windows and populating an environment with them uh, situated in the 3D world, attached to people, attached to your head, etc. cetera. Um, entertainment, like in this work, which is a collaborative sonic environment in which people can work together, in this case, in the video see-through displays to be able to go and create essentially a world full of uh, the bars of tuned percussion instruments and balls bouncing off of them. Um, and hybrid user interfaces, ones in which we combine together lots of different kinds of technologies all working in the same 3D space. In this case, a rear projected horizontal tabletop um, with views of buildings that violate the bezel because they're being seen through, in this case, one eye of a stereo video see-through display. You may recognize these buildings from ones in lower Manhattan. Now, what I'm gonna do is to sort of narrow in on one thing that's been of great interest to us for quite a while, and that's AR for task assistance. How do we assist people in performing tasks, maintenance, assembly, repair, um, in which there is something that needs to get done and maybe you don't fully know what it is you need to accomplish, whether the system is assisting you by yourself or whether you're perhaps working together with other people in which you're co-located with or perhaps people who are literally at completely different ends of, of, of the earth. And so what I now want to do is to dive into one particular project. Um, this one involves uh, an orientation guidance task it, in fact, is being done in the work I'll re initially show you using a very small field of view monoscopic device, which you might recognize as Google Glass, um, in a way in which we as researchers usually will not refer to this as augmented reality because we're not really making the virtual stuff um, essentially be uh, registered with the real stuff in the environment. And the reason we're not doing that is when Glass first came out, you would see a lot of people going on uh, YouTube and posting videos and saying, we're doing AR with Glass, as if it were really hard, um, because Glass has a camera in it, and it has a display and a computer. The problem is they would show you videos in which you could either see a full-size video with a view like this shot through Glass, uh, far bigger than it actually is, or maybe even a faked video in which you were using some of the tools that Google provides to not really have to shoot through the uh, eyewear itself. But one important point I want to point out over here is in this particular task, in which we're going to be trying to show a person how to take an object like, for example, this uh, power brick over here, held in their hand at whatever orientation they're holding it in, and we want to get them to turn it around in their hands one or both hands, to a particular different orientation, no matter what one they're starting in. And the question is, how do I show you how to do that if I have the ability to do this with 3D graphics? Right? Do I just show you the, the end result? Do I show you an animation to it? Do I show you how to rotate it about one or more axes? You know, what's going to be the best way to do it? Now, in this particular task, I'm showing you over here, this is a video of one of my students holding in his hands an object. You can see it's not very big. That's the one we're actually going to be providing instructions for in some of the images I'm going to show you. This is a view actually shot through glass. We really had a camera right behind it looking through it. You'll notice the size of it, the back of his hand over there. That is the size of the glass display. And what that means is if you put your arm out as far as you can like this, make a fist, angle up a little bit like that, what you will see through glass literally will fit okay, in the back of your hand. 
That's it. It's not going to be like this. It's not going to be like that. It's going to be literally only this big. Okay? There are a number of devices like that, or, uh, Intel ReconJet, uh, Vuzix M100, M300, uh, which are relatively lightweight devices. They don't provide a lot of stuff in front of your eyes. Uh, they're being used right now and in some cases already being used, in other cases about to be used in industry to provide people with assistance in a variety of tasks. What we're trying to do here is a 3D task um, and because of that small field of view, trying to overlay stuff on your view of this thing over here, you can see what it looks like as seen through at the same time, you're not going to be able to overlay very much of that object. So in what I'm going to show you, all of the overlaid stuff basically is going to be standalone. This little whitish thing over here is actually just a scaled down version of that larger object being held in the hand as opposed to registering the overlays right on top. I'll show you a version a little bit later that actually does that. So let me show you just a view now animated shot through glass. This is a particular uh, way of showing a person how to do this. Um, we're actually tracking the object, okay? And that's why that little thing is moving around as the person is actually performing the task. So the question is, how do we do this? And so now I want to dive a little bit more deeply, I think, than many of the talks uh, so far have, have gone into, into talking about some of the interaction and visualization techniques that we've developed for this particular project. I'm going to give you a subset of them. I'm going to go very, very quickly through them. But I want to give you a sense of sort of what goes through our minds as we actually do this kind of research. And so the first one I'm going to talk about is something we call single axis. And this basically is the notion that any uh, uh, 3D graphics geek would know that due to a 18th century rock star uh, mathematician, Leonard Euler, um, he managed to show that if you have an object, a rigid body object at any given orientation, and you want to get it to another orientation, no matter which orientation you start with an end, you can show that there'll be one single axis about which you can make one single rotation that will be the mathematically most efficient way to actually do that. Okay, a really neat result. And so this is the kind of thing where if you're a geek and you know about that, you'd say, let's do it that way. Let's show a person how to do it. And so in this particular um, visualization, our axis is being shown as this kind of barber pole cylinder that you're seeing over there. The direction and magnitude of how much to rotate is being shown with these dynamic curved arrows you're seeing in these different stages of this being performed. Um, the system is continuously updating based on the pose of this uh, tracked object. We do little things like making sure the arrow tip is always going to be facing the user to make it really easy to see. And let me show you what this looks like. I'm going to literally show you the graphics that runs on glass when we actually have you do this, in this case with a person really rotating it because it's going to uh, get you from the start to the finish. So here we see what this looks like. And when we hit the end, then you'll see it turn green. This is our way of saying you're done. So this is one of the stages or steps in a user study that a person actually performs after they've been shown how these different techniques. I'm going to show you one or two more and then sort of cut to the chase and, and tell you how these things compared. So here's another one. So another approach you might think would be, what if I showed you an animation? I'm holding an object in my hand. I'm going to overlay on top of it, or in this case next to it, an animation of where it's supposed to go. So it'll go zip like this, and then do it again, and then do it again. We'll do it in a loop. We'll have the object, um, the actual one that's being tracked, be rendered solid. We'll have the little animation of where it's supposed to go be rendered as more transparent, around 50% transparency. We'll start at whatever its current orientation is as you get closer and closer. Um, we will end up faster and faster, pausing a half second between iterations, going between its current orientation to the destination. So let me show you what that looks like. And then finally, our person ends up getting it done. So let me show you one more. And this is one, unlike the previous two that I just mentioned, which are kind of like the most obvious ones you'd come up with, this is one we came up with after a good deal of thinking and experimentation. And it ends up being the one that turns out to be the, the one that worked the best. 
And in this particular approach, we call it handles, there are two of these dynamic control icons, also known as handles. There are little barber pole-like things you can see sticking out of that copy of the object over there. There is a blue one and a red one, uh, very high visibility. We have two targets, little toruses or rings. You can see a red one and a blue one. The targets are always in the same place on a horizontal line at the side, always in front of the user, always facing the user. Um, and then what the user needs to do is by rotating the object and looking at this visualization, they need to rotate the handles into the rings. The red one into the red ring, the blue one into the blue ring. They can do it in any order they want to do it. They can maybe do the red one first, then do the blue one. They can sort of progressively approximate. They can try to actually move them smoothly together, which it turns out would be the same motion you would get if we actually showed you that optimal axis. Okay. And just to really make the correspondence clear, we have a set of arrows you can see, little red arrows that go from the red handle to its ring, blue arrows going from the blue handle to its ring, um, and that stream of arrows obviously gets shorter and shorter as you get closer and closer and closer. So this is what it looks like with someone doing it. And then when you get inside, the rings turn and the object itself ends up turning green. So. I will very quickly not try to bore you, but uh, when we develop things like this, we do formal user studies um, following uh, more informal pilot studies. This one had 17 participants. This is a single session experiment where people come in, they sign a consent form, they uh, participate in a series of trials. In this case, this is what's called a within-subject experiment. Each person actually tried all the different conditions, including ones that I hadn't talked about yet. We counterbalanced it by condition to make sure that we didn't privilege one particular condition by, let's say, always making it first or last. Um, we had an additional uh, condition, which was our kind of control. We had a static view of the target, um, which you're seeing over here. This is the destination. This is the one you're controlling, which is dynamically moving. And this is just saying, this is what it's supposed to look like. You figure out how to get this thing to look like that. You can always see what the target looks like. Um, and so we had, and each person tried all the conditions. They had practice trials. They had some actual time trials. We had, in our work, an acceptance threshold. You had to be within eight degrees before we'd say, yes, you actually had done it. Um, and to cut to the chase, uh, it turns out, and we expected this because it was based on uh, the, uh, uh, pilot studies that we had done, handles ended up being significantly faster than the other techniques. Now, in addition to that, and a lot of other results we got that I'm not going to have time to talk about, we tried to probe a little bit deeper. And so it was kind of interesting is that if you look at what people do, they kind of, they move very quickly at first and they kind of slow down towards the end. You can think of that as being a more ballistic motion followed by the kind of fine tuning to get it just right before we actually accept it. And if you look at just the ballistic part, it turns out that handles and animate were pretty much neck and neck. You really could not see a statistically significant difference between them, okay? Um, however, if you looked at the fine tuning part, where the heights of the bars over here are the ballistic part and that fine tuning part at the end, then the height over here is, turns out to be significantly less than the height over there for handles versus animate. And it was that fine tuning in which handles ended up really winning. Okay, so having very, very quickly sort of taken you with a whirlwind tour through that approach, I want to mention that uh, in addition to doing this with glass, uh, we've also done this with AR in which we really are registering the virtual and physical stuff. There's a demo that uh, Carmen Alvesio is giving up on the third floor. Um, and what I'm going to show you right now is just an example shot through um, with this video or their optical see-through demo. Um, however, the video I'm going to show you, the demo is running on HoloLens. Uh, rather than shooting through HoloLens, which turns out not to work when you're using Vuforia tracking, if you actually shoot with its built-in camera, which isn't what you really see anyway, the video in this case is actually created by shooting through a separate camera just to give you a sense of what you would see if you were actually using the HoloLens camera were it to be supported. So this is an example of a somewhat different object, and now we're using that handles technique to actually get the handles inside of their rings. So you're welcome to go and try this and the other techniques upstairs.
And at this point, I'd like to acknowledge the many students and colleagues that worked on this stuff, the funding agencies that funded it. Um, and then finally to put in a plug for a demo that we're doing at SIGGRAPH at VR Village, uh, end of July, beginning of August, in which we're going to be demoing some of the collaborative AR work that we're doing with a remote expert advising using full 3D AR, a local technician. So if you're going to SIGGRAPH, please you know, show up at VR Village and, and uh, play with our demo. Thank you.